This morning, I have uh, taken a theme, let it go, let it go. You know, and it is very interesting that the moment I chose to go in that direction, and I happened to just walk out of the church, somebody drove a kind and sort of almost ran me over. You know, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. And I, I have come to the reality that I'm going to let it go. I turned in the direction that the car was going and started to do my 100 meters because that's the natural instinct. But God said, you're going to speak on letting it go. It's hard to let it go when you feel you have every right to hold on to it. This morning, uh, look at the book of Luke chapter 17, verse 1. Downwards. 1 to 5. And he said to his disciples, that's interesting. He's not talking to the unchurched. He's not talking to those who are outside the kingdom. He's talking to believers. He's talking to the twelve who he was who are going to shape the world. Because prophetically he had insight. <laughs> To look into the future and realize that one of the major distractions to finishing your destiny would be what he was about to talk about. It is inevitable that offense shall come. But woe to him through whom it comes. That's interesting. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea than he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. So two categories of people. One is a group of people who are more mature in their expression and faith than those who weren't. Be on your guard. There's a strong word there in the original. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive. In Matthew 18, don't turn to the read. Verse 21, that Peter said to him, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. In other words, Peter is trying to place a limit on forgiveness. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of completion. Up to a limit. Because the Peter types struggle with this whole issue of forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I find it challenging every day of my life. Uh, I, am, I looked at my phone at about quarter to ten, and uh, my wife had run me. That's a surprise. And uh, I'm trying to intensely concentrate on what I have to prepare, and, uh, and uh, I see this as a distraction. Now we are all vulnerable. Okay, some of you look more sanctified than me, but I am saved by the grace of God, and I am who I am by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. At least one person like this. So, we are going to deal with the relationship there. And I thought, what's your name here? This time for? And my sister said, slow down. And then she asked me, did you take your tablets because I got to go to my son's house, and that's another exciting journey. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so it's easy to get distracted. Peter put a, lead, a ceiling on offense. <laughs> a 
And then Jesus explains the parable and says, you will learn to forgive to the extent that you understand God's forgiveness in your life. Offense is inevitable. It's inevitable. But when we get offended, we have to choose our outcome. Whether we are going to stay offended or let it go. That was Peter's struggle. As it is to all of us. Every moment in life, we have to make a choice. And you know what I've learned experientially? That people who grow up in dysfunctional homes and environments where father and mother were shouting at each other all the time or disagreeing with each other all the time will struggle with a higher level of offense than those who grow up in a reasonably functional family. Every family or not is dysfunctional. It's just the measuring tool can be different. Some people have this unique ability not to get offended. And I think, wow, I wish I could be like them. And then 30 seconds later, I see them blow up. Some blow up externally, others do it internally. Because if they don't do it externally, they might get the cricket match. They're not the score. In some cultures. It's inevitable that offenses should come. But what we choose to do with our emotions is a life choice. In the book of Genesis chapter 4, I will do verse 1 to 7 first. Now the man had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. And again she gave birth to a brother, Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a killer on the ground. So it came to pass in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to God. And Abel on his part also brought of the firstling of the flocks and of the fat portion thereof. And the Lord had regard to Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to him, Why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be lifted up? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must learn to master it. You see, God had designed that this family function in unity. Family unity is the heart of God. But somewhere in this journey of life, Cain got offended because God appears to accept Abel's offering and reject his own. I will read an, a, a part of an article here which I took from the book. I am not accountable for the gifts God gives someone else. God does not expect me to produce beyond the level of the gifting he has given me. My obligation is to use my God-given gift to the best of my ability. The gifts God gives someone else are not the same as the gifts he has given me. And it's all right. <coughs> Cain lived by comparisons. And when we live by comparisons, somebody's life will always seem to be better. Comparisons lead to discontent, jealousy, envy, and strife. Paul, the great apostle, says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I have learned to abound, and I have learned to be amazed. 
Because when my life is under God's sovereignty, everything that happens in my life is under His control. And I know without a shadow of doubt, if I stay committed to the purpose of God, that the destiny He has for me will come to pass. You know, there's another thing I realized after 44 years of this journey called life, spiritual life, that the only person who can stop me from reaching my destiny is me. Well, I can tell you stories. I've been there. The only person that can stop you from fulfilling your God-given potential is not some outside force, but you. And so God is talking to Cain. In Luke 17, Jesus is talking to his disciples and, and he's telling them, you who are more mature in the faith, be careful that you don't stumble people who are younger in their faith than you are. It's better for a millstone to be wrapped around your neck and you will be thrown into the sea. Wow, that's some strong language. The very language gets, gets offensive. But Jesus never apologized for offending people. You see, another thing I've learned in church life is this. You know why people get offended in church? Because when they come from outside in the church, they carry the spirit of offense inside them. And it is just a question of time before some word of God brings that offense to the surface so that God can deal with it. An offense is almost always rooted in dysfunctional early childhood experiences of hurt wounding and rejection by a parent. More often from a father than a mother. But Jesus is telling his disciples, your offense and mine can have a devastating effect on younger Christians and you cause them to stumble and fall. And they never darken the doors of a church again. Wow, that's pretty strong stuff. And he doesn't apologize for this. So he said, be careful. Guard your heart, guard your life, guard your words and your communication. If you and I have nothing positive to tell somebody, don't say it. There are people who are weaker in their expression of faith, but God doesn't reject them. Because we are saved by grace and not by works, lest anyone should boast. We are saved by grace. Grace is a constant denominator, was a constant denominator in the life of Jesus. And you know what people who are legalistic find hard about grace? Because grace is offered to people who least deserve it. God said of David, I have found me a man after my own heart. Wow. John 1.17 The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ. Grace and truth. And often because of our humanity, we never get the balance right. This is the grace. If you and I do nothing for God on this planet, He still loves us and accepts us unconditionally. And that is a biblical reality we have to come to terms with. Not only in dealing with our own lives, but in the lives of others. Then we don't become hard and judgmental of people who we think are less spiritual than we are. Unity was designed by God to be a powerful force to strengthen an universe and, and influence. One shall slay a thousand, 
to 10,000. And God is, in Psalm 133, he talks about the unity of the brother and the unity of the family. It's, it's like the ointment oil that flowed from Aaron's head to the soles of his feet. Unity must be preserved in the context of a family. Then unity can be produced in the life of a church. Spiritual battles are won or lost. In our ability to find the anointing that rests in unity. When we are divided, we are many. When we are united, we are one. God has created a structure in the context of the family. And when we function together within the context of that structure, we are a powerful force that can withstand all of the forces of darkness that come against us. And so the one thing that Satan will do is to create disunity in the nuclear family because there will be an outward effect of that disunity everywhere else. Disunity leads to divisiveness and becomes the biggest distraction to the advancement of God's cause and the cause of the family. And constantly we see push-pulls, push-pulls in the context of family life. One is pushing, one is pulling. One is pushing, one is pulling. And sometimes we do it in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, by this shall the world know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. And the word he uses there is not that you just like people who get along with you and agree with you. No, no, no. That you like the unlikable. Oh my gosh, that is a painful process. But like I said last week, and I got a couple of raised hands, you only get to choose your bride and bridegroom. Let's not leave the ladies out. By the way, your you, you announcement said girls, does it cover 16 to 76? You got a more positive perspective than mine. So, there you go. Jealousy has the power to separate God's people. And often it is jealousy that gives us the inability to celebrate somebody else's success. <coughs> jealousy exaggerates what forgiveness chooses to forget. <coughs> we have to embrace each other even though we may not like each other. We are called to love each other. Love is a word. You like somebody who agrees with you. You like somebody who looks just like you. If I look at a group of people, they are all alike. That's why they click together. Hello? Satan's objective was to divide what God wanted to unite. And you know what happens when we are divided as a family? With every division, our voices are weakened. Our unity and influence dissipated and our witness punished. And we as Christians have nothing to offer a divided world. Okay. Unity is not that we just get along. No, no, no. Unity is that we agree that there are some people who are weaker in their expression of faith than we are. But we embrace them, we love them, and we accept them because God has. Yes, so we don't walk around with a measuring tool to measure somebody else's spirituality. Only God can do God looked into the heart of David and he said, there is something in this guy that I can draw out. Paul, the great apostle, he was responsible for the murder of Stephen in the New Testament. Yet God looked into Saul's life and said, I am a turnaround God. 
I have the ability to take this guy and turn him around and use him in a way that I could not use the others because there's something inside of him that I see which others didn't. So God has a sense of humor. And you look at people in a way that you're like, yeah, no, I don't know about them. Be careful. You're doing the same thing that Jesus warned about. He says, if you have that approach to life, it's better that you put a millstone around your neck and jump into the ocean because you'll only go to the bottom pretty fast. That's strong stuff. And he's not apologetic for it. Wow. You see, these two brothers brought offerings. But they had a different approach. Abel's offering was more acceptable to God because he had the right approach to a holy God. It was a blood sacrifice which pointed, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, which pointed to the ultimate sacrifice and expression of Jesus' death on the cross. Because it says in the book of Hebrews that Abel brought unto God a more acceptable offering. And, and here's the secret. Don't do things in kingdom life just because you are asked to do it. If you don't have the right heart attitude, don't do it at all. Because God says the heart. God, God is a holy God and somehow I think in the charismatic church we have lost the holiness of God. God's holiness doesn't change with the passing of time or the cultures we live in. God is holy. In Isaiah chapter 6, the angels covered their faces and said, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord. God's holiness doesn't change under grace. God is holy. And he requires we walk in holiness. It's not a biblical extra or an option. And when you and I approach God with an attitude of God's holiness and a consciousness of that holiness, we will approach Him with the right heart attitude. Both brothers brought fruit of worship to the Lord, but God respected one and rejected the others. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So God comes up to Cain. Wow. And He's telling him, I want to do something on you, in your life too. I have a destiny for you too. Sin lies at the door. Its desire is to overcome you. But you have to learn to master it. God was giving Cain an opportunity to repent. And people who live in the prison of jealousy have an alternative that they need to turn to. You don't need to live your life measuring yourself by somebody else's life. You can create your own destiny and your own life purpose by living the right purpose. That's all. But you know what King does? He goes out and slays his brother. That's sad. He got frustrated with destiny's process. And he wanted a shortcut. You know, let me tell you something. Successful people work really hard. While others sit on their heads. God doesn't throw success into you. God gives you the tools and the principles, but you got to work really hard. Even in Kingdom living. I was in a Korean church with half a million people. The senior pastor is 77. He has planted 48 churches. He wants to plant a thousand. He wants to live till he's 120. He wants the 120 anointing. Pastor Colton didn't want it, so he went early. He told me that. He said, Oh, I don't want the 120 anointing. So he got only 89 or 90. I, 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 I'm, I'm stretching it. And so I asked him, I, I said, what's the secret? He said, there is no secret. You just work hard. 
You work 16 hours a day. Wow. Sleep 6 hours. I said, Reverend Joe, this body needs a, a minimum of it. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. Hallelujah. Because half a million people means half a million problems. No. That part of the journey I don't want. I am done. That's not negative, I'm just being real. God was saying, King, there's something in you that I want to bring out. But I need your partnership to bring it out. It's one thing to get offended, it's another thing to stay offended. When you allow a spirit of offense to creep into your life, it will become a stronghold. And you know what a stronghold is? Anything that has a stronghold is a stronghold. And you want to look at your early life and you want to look at all the negative stuff that happened to you or didn't happen to you and you got to start telling yourself, I've had enough of this. I am going to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and find freedom. Freedom is a choice. You and I can walk in liberty. My obligation is to use the gift God has given me and not worry about what God is doing in somebody else's life. So I encourage you this morning, take the focus on somebody else and bring that focus back to where it is. Cain took a detour of offense upward and he ended his brother's life and his life takes a path that God never intended. And you know something, even in judgment, there was grace. Verse 15, so the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. What a sad day. And you know something, I have seen in my life journey, People go out from the presence of God because number one, somebody in this church has stumbled them or number two, they made a bad choice to stay offended and go it, it, it just comes out of that. You walk out of something hoping for something better one thing I've learned experientially is the grass isn't green always on the other side of the hill. It's green bearing water. Water. Wow. He was born to be part of something bigger called family. But Cain allowed his own dysfunction and disobedience to cause him to move away from the very destiny and purpose that God had made. And there's no sad ending. So you walk away from the presence of God and you walk away from the purpose of God and you walk away from the destiny of God. And you know as a pastor, there is nothing sadder for me to see than somebody who has allowed offense to come into their life through somebody's stupid words or actions. And I can tell you one thing, one day you got to stand before God and you will be held accountable. There's no getting past that. So be careful with your words. Words are powerful. Don't use them carelessly. Don't criticize people because they have a, what you think is a weaker faith than you have or a different spirit. You have a spirit of excellence and they don't. They are still on a journey. Be graceful to them and help them get there. And it's not easy. I was, I was uh, watching a, a certain preacher and, and, and he was talking about the prison of offense. And, and then uh, his, his power points didn't come out. And, and he got really upset because he put 16 hours of work into this whole sermon. And his power points are not coming out. I can identify. And then God reminded him, Jesus had no PowerPoints, but he did a better job than you did. So don't worry whether the worship leader is off key or the 
the, the guy with the guitar went whack. Don't worry about that. That's not your problem. Don't make it yours. You fix up your life and then God fix up the others. Do it with us. So an easy day for some of us who are perfectionists. This morning I got up and I looked at my shoes and I said I don't want my partners to look at my shoes because I ain't going to punish them. He <laughs> said I really want this message. So I quickly ran out and I hit my shoes from us. <laughs> Just have another look, it's still not punished. I thought some of the Solomon boys would <laughs> say something, but they didn't either. <laughs> and God says, hey, don't worry about the small stuff, just fix the big stuff up. When you fix the inside, the outside becomes more easier to live with. And my wife is saying, amen, amen to that. <laughs> you see, I'm a little bit different. Wow. Remember, it's the same pattern of destruction and division was to visit every home, every family, if we can it. The cause of Jesus Christ is the glue that holds together what Satan wants to pull apart. The internal conflict that Cain experienced sucked the spiritual life out of Cain. Therefore, we need to do the work we need to do to build our own lives and stay away from other people's dreams, other people's visions and obsessing about what other people are doing or not doing. In my early Christian life, I spent a lot of time obsessing about what other people were doing because I didn't know better. But now I know when I stay committed to God and I walk past the stronghold of offense. Satan loses power over my life and like Abel, even though I am dead, I can walk into the fullness of the destiny and purpose that God has designed for me. I've had a church leader try to stop me from my destiny. But today, I have fulfilled it. I was told that much learning has made me mad. Now you know, that's exciting to come from a church leader. Somebody you looked up to. But I had to learn to walk past the pain, the hurt, the disappointment and preach seven times in the second largest church in the world because of the place of God. Wow, you wish you can see me now. It's hard to stay humble. I say humility is not my strength. You know that. <laughs> I wrote to Pastor Alan Davis, I sent him a photo and I said, I want to show you this because I have done better than you have. And I said, humility is not a strength of mine. I repented after that. He probably, he, he probably draw attention to that email when he's here in February. Is that kind of guy? Somebody told me the story about him. I don't know how far this is true, but I told him this. He said his neighbor threw one, uh, one bag of rubbish away into his yard. He threw back two. I like him. <laughs> wow. How many of you are like that? Put your hands up. Come on, I'll point you out. Come on, come on. Put your hands up, but I'm going to point you out. We are human. But we are saved by the grace of God. Please sanitize this when it goes on the website. <laughs> I love you. You see, God was trying to put Cain back on track, keep his focus. Paul, uh, sorry, God didn't call Cain to apologize. He called Cain to action, 360 turnover. And he said, Cain, offense has a consequence. It's not worth it. Let it go. Let it go. However hurt you have been, the hurt is real, we can't deny it. The pain is real, the lack of fathering is real. It is one of the most painful things in life. But by the grace of God, says Paul, I am who I am. Nothing can change that. We live in the power of destiny. 
We don't live in the power of pain. We don't live in the power of disappointment. We don't live in the power of offense. We learn to walk past those things because the grace of God is accessible. And God was telling Cain, I have a way out. Take it. Take it. But he didn't. And he became a wagon upon the face of the earth. He ended up in a place he shouldn't have. And my heart aches for him. My heart beats for people like that. Because I know what pain is. I know what disappointment is. I know what betrayal is. I know what hurt is. I know what it is to have a stab in the back and still keep moving to the destiny. Because God's destiny and purpose for your life is greater, should be greater than your greatest disappointment. 2 Samuel chapter 6, we are going to look at another conflict in the context of family. Verse 16, 2 Samuel 6 verse 16, Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, that Micah, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw, saw, that's the important word, she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Wow. You see, here is a good marriage, gone south. And I am convinced that David played a part in it. David gets a good write up and she doesn't get as much. But two takes two people to fight. So David is fulfilling his destiny. He's fulfilling his destiny. He has brought the ark of God to Jerusalem and and he's bearing a linen ephod instead of a royal robe. Now you know these were two different personalities. And I, I don't think the Bible says he's not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, you know. That's true in one sense. But I believe this yoking thing has more than just a spiritual part of nature. It goes beyond that. It goes far beyond. Marriage is not just sexual. It's emotional. There's a compatibility. That's why we encourage people go through six counseling sessions before you decide to marry at all. You don't decide to marry and then come for counseling. That's a bit put in the cart before the horse. Uh, counseling determines whether we should marry at all. Saul's daughter gave, risked her life for David. In 1 Samuel 17, it says, Mikar, that's the Mikar, loved David. Wow. And I am convinced that her attraction to David was because he had slain a giant. And every young single woman in Israel would have loved to marry him. And David is a sneaky guy even on his best day. Right? Man of God. Man of God. Man of the God. But there was a sneakiness to his life as it is to all of us who some of you guys don't smile. You know what I'm talking about. You look all spiritual from up here. He thought this is a shortcut to the throne. Because God had promised the throne. So he wanted to fast track what we call the process. But God had other ideas. And uh, maybe I'll marry her, you know, I don't want to marry Saul's elder, but I'll marry the younger one. I don't know how that works out, but I, I, I won't go down that road, I won't go down that road. <laughs> tempted, tempted, but I won't go. I'm, I'm looking at the clock. Okay. And so. David didn't give her the time of the day that she needed as a woman. <coughs> he's, one, he's busy writing Psalms, he's writing the kingdom, he's fulfilling his destiny, but he has neglected her destiny. And she's watching from the window, she should have been down there. She saw him dancing with a linen ephod, and if you know anything about linen at the time, although we don't want to go there because you might get the visual. <laughs> and he is here now. <laughs> and 
so she's embarrassed because she is used to dictate. <laughs> One of the original writers of the Talmud says, Ben, she walked as a queen, she walked with dignity. You know, at this size, I could never walk. <laughs> but here's the truth. Wives don't try to change your husband. Pray for him. If you have an issue. She said, you're not acting in a dignified manner. What had happened is, there was a separation of about 14 years, 14, 15 years between David and his wife. And in the meantime, she, her father gave her in marriage somebody else. And then that guy never had a physical relationship with her because he was honorable. He was more honorable than David was. You know, David isn't the most honorable guy in the Bible, but for a man of God, you're not that God sovereignty. Right, now you want me to explain God's sovereignty. I can't because if I can, he's not God. Right, just put this in a nutshell. And so David comes home to bless his house. But Mikael was a very insecure woman like her father was. And some of that DNA had passed on to the next of kin. And so when David acts like this in this extravagant manner, she said, you are getting successful at my expense. There was a strained relationship and Michal allowed the strain to speak and she chose the wrong time. She was the wrong time. So why is I want to encourage you? Believe the best for your marriage. Don't assume the worst. Learn to manage conflict better. Cultivate healthy boundaries. Choose the time and the place for your argument. Remind yourself, offense has shut down power. Refuse to allow offense to direct the, define the direction of your life. Remind yourself why you married in the first instance. She's, she, she, she's dishonoring the word there. You are like a worthless fellow. In Matthew 5, 22, it means empty, worthless. You are like an idiot. Wow. And David's anger rises up. He was angry. He was not the most angry guy in the Bible. I have chartered his life because I can identify with some idiots. Oh, I'm David too. <laughs> <laughs> but I find some common ground there. Men are not bad men. They are just grown up without the affirmation of a father. And that's the root of the anger. And so you need to understand that. And you need to soothe that anger. Not add fuel to the fire, but they are both human. And so David, Verse 20, verse 20. But when David returned to bless his house, David walks in to bless his house, she just dumped it on him. Wives have to honor husbands, they have to respect husbands. There is no negotiation. God requires us to. And so he gives it to him. How the king of Israel distinguished himself to the uncovered himself in the eyes of his servant maid as the foolish one, shameless and God. So David said, It was before the Lord. But you know what, sister? You have seen nothing yet. <laughs> I love that guy. He's Lana just going to dance before the house, I'm going to dance before the whole. But with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished. And Michael Nikar had no child till the day of her death. The marriage was over. There were two people living in the same house but in different rooms. That's Managers are not made in heaven. Marriage is hard work. Yesterday, I said, if I knew marriage is so hard, I would have been that poor and still see that. She gave me a positive response, I can't tell you what it was. <laughs> How many of you guys agree marriage is hard work? Put your hands up. Some bold guys here? <laughs> um, okay, now, 
Now that's your side of the argument. How many of you say, ladies, think it's even harder than you thought? <laughs> it's hard work. But you know what? I am not going to let division, divisiveness, offense stand in the way of my destiny. As husband and wife, we are going to stand together and we are going to work to our destiny and purpose because God's purpose for bringing us together is greater than the offense that pulls us apart. Shall we all stand? I'm going to sing a song. I love the song. YouTube. Thank God for YouTube. Next best thing to craft cheese. The, the, the worship leader asked, you on the band? I said, no, I want